Thank you, everybody. Beautiful music. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Maddie. Maddie will be preaching next week before she goes back, so please make a point of being here. We're very excited about that. Jan, thank you for reading the scripture passage. Why don't you all join me in prayer as we get started? God, it has been quite a year, 2021, and as we step with a little bit of trepidation into 2022, I pray that your spirit would come and settle upon this place, come and settle in our hearts. Open our minds, open our ears, open our spirits to commune with yours. Surprise us with a new word. Feed us with exactly what we need this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. So the field of biblical, biblical archaeology is a fascinating and constantly evolving one. They're always making new discoveries, putting together old clues and coming to new conclusions. Scholars had always been stumped why it was that it seemed that the wise men hadn't wrapped any of their gifts. It seemed like there was no paper, no tape, no bows, no strings, no nothing. But recently, they've made a real breakthrough in that they realized exactly what was going on. The reason that the wise men didn't wrap their presents was because, one, they were wise, and two, they were men. Ha, 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 ha. The truth is that we know very little about the wise men, these three kings that we are always talking about. The Gospel of Matthew, which is really the only place that we hear anything about this story. It never says that they were wise men. It never says that they were kings. It doesn't say that there were three of them. And it doesn't even say that they were men. He just calls them magi from the east. We assume that there were three because there were three gifts, right? But they could have gone halvesies, a couple of them for each gift. Some deadbeat magi might have shown up without any gift for the party. We don't know how many there were. The whole king's thing, we think, probably comes from the book of Psalm 72, verse 10, which says, May the kings of Tarshish and the isles render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. Or Isaiah 49, 7, that says, Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and the Holy One, Kings shall see and stand up, princes will bow down, and they will prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful. The truth is that there is few aspects of the Christmas story that have captured our collective cultural imaginations more than these three magi. They appear on Christmas cards and TV shows and even in our nativity sets, even though the text infers that they probably came up to two years later than all the other characters in our sets. They show up in poems and plays and songs and shopping malls. All of the great artists painted this regal trio, from Rembrandt to Michelangelo, from Botticelli to Fra Angelico. There's one painting made in 1487 by Gerlandeo entitled The Adoration, which isn't really surprising because most of the great artists named their masterpieces of this scene, the adoration, but it takes on a whole new idea in this one in 1487, where the oldest of the three wise men is kneeling before Jesus and sort of staring directly between his chubby little legs as Jesus very coyly lifts up his loincloth for the wise man to see all of his humanity. This is, this is true which gives the idea of the adoration a whole new kind of, kind of idea. I promise you can't make this stuff up. Scholars tell us that the term magi was used in Persia, modern-day Iran, 
for intellectuals who were dream interpreters. But by the time that Jesus came around, it was referring to these pseudoscientists, these stargazers, astronomers, fortune tellers. The Greek root of the word magi comes from magos, which is where we get the terms magic and magician from. Many believe that the magi were ancient Zoroastrian priests who would use constellations and patterns in the sky to gain wisdom and direction for their lives, which may be kind of hard for us to grasp in our 2,000 years later in our scientific era. I mean, can you try to wrap your mind around a time when they used stars and astrological patterns for personal advice? Just seems kind of crazy, doesn't it? What we do know is that according to Matthew, these magi followed this star coming from the east, most likely from Iran, believing that something totally new was happening in our world, somewhere in the world, that something that they did not understand yet was breaking into our world, and that their reaction to it wasn't fear, but was curiosity. Interesting, isn't it? Because truth be told, we're all on a journey to, discom to discover something new, to discover something more in this life that we don't experience on the surface. And as they begin to get close, as they start to hone in on where the star is hovering, and I'll, I'll tell you, I don't know if you ever did this, but when I was a kid, the first time I heard this story, I remember going outside and trying to figure out if you could actually tell what town or even what dwelling a star was floating above. And all I can tell you is whenever I tried to do it, it seemed like the star would move wherever I went. Now there is a lot about nature that can connect us to God and to allow us a closer walk with God if we will only allow it. I feel closer to God in nature than anywhere else. I un certainly understand those who say, oh, you know, my sanctuary is up in the mountains, or I find that I really worship when I'm down at the beach at sunset. Because the truth is that the divine fingerprint is all over all of the aspects of God's nature. And yet nature will only get us so far. Which is why when the wise men show up in Jerusalem and they start asking where this king of the Jews who is being born is, it says that the priests and the scholars, they turn to what? The scriptures, right? They go to the scriptures because nature only brings us so far. And it's there that they discover that the Messiah is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And it says that when Herod hears this, he's disturbed, he's frightened. And it says, all of Jerusalem is frightened with him. They are literally shaking in their sandals because a frightened tyrant is a dangerous and unpredictable tyrant. Fear drives violent and destructive behavior. Fear holds back progress. It imprisons people under false assumptions. Herod was afraid because another king might threaten his power. And so he directs the wise men to Bethlehem. And as Maddie says, tells them, and when you figure out the address, let me know so that I can worship him too which of course meant that he was going to be sending out a death squad as soon as he figured out where this baby was to have him slaughtered. And even though Jesus had no intention of taking Herod's throne, Herod was right to be worried because this new king, this new kind of king, brought good news to the poor and lifted up the lowly. His kingship would indeed be 
a threat, a threat to the structures and the status quo of the system of his day. It would mess up the hierarchy. All those with privilege were going to be asked to share their power with the powerless. Those with plenty would be asked to share their abundance with the hungry. Those who bolstered up their influence by demanding unswerving loyalty were going to find their power undermined. And so the wise men, they take this final six-mile jaunt westward to Bethlehem, and they find Mary and Joseph and the baby, and they get down on their knees, and they worship him, and they open their bags and present him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And perhaps one of the most beautiful things about this story, it is the first time of many that Jesus is going to be welcoming the Gentile world into the kingdom of God with all of its racial and religious diversity. This is one of the most beautiful things about this story. The Magi are a foreshadowing of the Gentile Christians. They're a foreshadowing of us. But the thing that I really want to focus in on this, in this sermon today, is the final line of the story. Throughout this past month, we have been talking throughout the Advent and Christmas season about these themes of home and our longing for home and our homesickness in this world for something that this world cannot provide. We've talked about how ever since the Garden of Eden that you and I have been wandering as pilgrims and nomads in this world looking for something more. And like the Magi, this, this desire for more to life, it's deeply ingrained in all of us. Along the way, we create temporary homes for ourselves and our loved ones, but None of them last forever. And so as great as the homes that we create around us are, we all continue to long and ache and yearn for something that this world will never be able to provide. And so the last line that Maddie just read, the last line of the story says, And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they return to their country by another route. Another translation says, they returned home by another way. <laughs> Pretty much sums up our life right now, doesn't it? All of 2021, all of 2020 and 21. Sometimes going home by another way is not our choice. I don't know about you, but I like to be in control of my life. And yet it seems like life never goes along the straight paths that I have planned for it. We're all familiar with plan B, aren't we? Maybe even plan C and D. I feel like this year we're somewhere around plans X, Y, or Z. Like the hurricanes in the Gulf, we're going to be having to start at A again. Feels like a common theme that I've been hearing from many of you as I talk to you in our Bible studies and informal conversations. I've been reading about it in the news and seeing it on TV, just how many people are feeling so exhausted and depleted by all that continues to go on. Many people are feeling sad and defeated. This is certainly not where we thought we were going to be two years after this global pandemic begun. Do you remember when we thought that it was going to be gone by that first Easter? And then certainly by the summer, right? We changed our travel plans from the beginning of that summer to the end of that summer, thinking it was all going to be gone. And then certainly by this last summer, 
We had all sorts of plans for welcome back, and then the Delta variant hit. And then we were sure that was going to be gone by Christmas at least. And then the Omicron came. And more and more people are catching the virus. Thank God it's not as deadly as it used to be, but that doesn't make it a whole lot less scary, does it? People we know, more people we know are, are getting sick. Our plans are being canceled. So many of you weren't able to be with the people you wanted to be with, with your loved ones this Christmas. So often we are put onto plan B, and it is no choice of our own. We are sent on detours and side trips and side tracks. But this is the way life is, isn't it? What's that old saying that you, I, I tell God my plans and God laughs at me? In this control freak world, and particularly our control freak culture in this nation, we might do well to take a lesson from the Muslim playback from the Muslim playbook. What do they say? Salah. If it is God's will. I also have to remember that God's overarching purpose in my life isn't to keep me safe and warm and comfortable and trouble-free for 99 years until I drift off to heaven in my sleep. God's purpose in our lives is so much bigger than that. God wants us to come into an intimate kind of communion with God. A trusting, loving relationship. God wants to help us to become something, to become something beautiful and sacred and holy in these few days that we have here on this planet. And that everything we go through, whether it's our plan or not our plan, whether it's a detour or a plan X or Y or Z, that all of it is being used to draw us closer into the arms of the God who loves us and to help us to become something beautiful that God has created us to be. And so sometimes... The detours come, and it's not our choice. We get a diagnosis. We lose a job, or we lose a loved one. Our flight is canceled again, or the PCR test comes back positive. If M. Scott Peck is right, and he is right, as he says in the opening of his book, Road, The Road Less Traveled, he says, life is difficult. And the sooner we come to terms with that, the easier everything else becomes. As much as is being taken away from us right now, God is also using this time to teach us important lessons about life, about God, about faith, about ourselves. God is using this time to mold us and shape us into the people that God needs and wants us to be. And so my best advice as we head into 2022, as we try not to just dump 2021 into the garbage too quickly, that we be open to the lessons that God is teaching us, to the people that God is trying to help us become in the midst of all of this. Sometimes we end up on this road, this road home by another way, and it's not our choice. Other times we need to make a choice to take the road less traveled, to take the detour, to go on that road that we were not expecting. I have to be honest with you, I, I don't know if there has ever been a time when we need to choose another road more urgently. 
pandemics, and vaccines, and boosters, political division, social upheaval. Everyone who has a personal encounter with this child, this incarnate God, Jesus Christ, has to make a choice. Are we going to go back on the road to Herod and all that that means with its fear and its power and its control? Or are we going to go on the road home toward Jesus? A road of love and forgiveness and trust and reconciliation. Because anyone who has a genuine encounter with this child, anyone who is willing to pick this child up out of the cradle and hold him close to your heart, your life can never be the same again. You can never go home the way you came. You must always go home by a different way. When we encounter Jesus Christ, it changes things. It changes us. We have to take a different road that counters the prevalent culture of violence and exploitation and control, and materialism, and protecting ourselves and our own. We can't go back to business as usual. I don't know if there's ever been a time when those important questions of meaning and existence more desperately need to be asked and answered. Simone Weil, the ancient mystic, once said, Christ prefers that we seek the truth even more than him. Because if we seek the truth honestly, we won't go far before we find ourselves falling back into Christ's arms. And so it says, the Magi went home a different way. Are you a different way because you found this child? Do you go home differently because you spend time here worshiping Jesus Christ? Because there is a search. There is a journey that lies at the heart of what it means to be human on this broken planet of ours. Devote your life to this search and you will find the answers that you have been seeking. Devote yourself to this search and your soul will discover the very thing that we are all aching for. I really don't know if there has ever been a time when we've needed it more. Amen.